take your Bibles and go to First Peter chapter 4. We have, a few weeks ago, looked at some of the prophecy in Daniel as Tom has walked us through some of that and hopes to continue that in the future. Uh, we're going to look at Matthew 24 and what Jesus says about the end times as well. But we've taken a few uh, weeks here, three weeks, to just take a little break from that. Um, and hopefully, if you've been following along, you've picked up on um, the reality that we don't um, lose ourselves in prophecy and t- to the extent that we forget what we're supposed to be doing right now, that we have responsibilities right now before the Lord, that we don't start looking so far um, to the end, whether that's um, sooner or later, that we forget the things that we should be doing now. Um, people ask in the last year and a half, um, not just Christians but unbelievers, is this the end? They were seeing the effect on the whole world of coronavirus and pandemics and all these different things that are uh, taking place with lockdowns and the way the governments are responding to this and they're saying, is this the end? Um, maybe, maybe not. We don't know whether we're getting close. We know we're getting closer today. Or we're closer today than we were yesterday. But whether that's today or tomorrow or years from now, we don't know that. But what should be of more concern to us is what are we doing as we wait for the end? And so we've tried to direct our minds that way, and we want to do that again uh, today with First Peter chapter 4. And let's begin reading in verse 7. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's very grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Well, let's pray. We come to hear your word, Father. And we come through Jesus Christ. But we also come by the power of your spirit, knowing that it's only by your spirit that we can have understanding. And we thank you for your spirit that indwells all those who trust in your son. We thank you for your word that he illuminates our minds to be able to understand and to receive. And we pray for that now, that we would know more of what you call us to, more of what we are to be busy about while we wait for the end. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Peter begins, the end of all things is at hand, is soon meaning that there's really nothing else that needs to happen before the end. We're coming to the end, whether that's, again, tomorrow, whether that's five days from now, whether that's a year from now, we are moving towards the end. The end is at hand. Christ has already come once, has died for our sins, has risen again, has ascended to the Father, and we await for him to return for his church and eventually to establish his kingdom. But what are we to be doing? The world would panic if they knew the end is coming. They would, they would have great anxiety, great fear. They would either start buying stuff or selling stuff or um, building a bunker underground to withstand whatever might come. But what are we to do as Christians? What does God command us to do as Christians? And this is what... We see here. Now, it's important that we understand that we do need to live in light of the end. 
We shouldn't just set that aside and say, well, that's for someone else to think about. Peter wants us to see life in light of the end. And just a quick survey of First Peter tells us that. First Peter 1, 7. So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 113. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 2.12, keep your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. 4.13, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's suffering that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. And even for elders, even for leaders of the church, they are to do everything they do with this in mind, 5-4, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. We are to be looking towards the end as we live in this life. We live in this life of suffering, of uh, a fallen world with all that happens in this world. We are to be looking towards the end. That is clear from Peter's words throughout this book. But as we're looking towards the end, what are we to be doing? And we see the imperatives here, the Christian imperatives in the midst of end times and enthusiasm that we live among. Peter says this, in the end, the end of all things is at hand. And then he says, guard your prayers. First of all, guard your prayers. Notice, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. For the sake of your prayers. Do what for the sake of my prayers? Be self-controlled. Be of, of sound mind. Be temperate. Don't be out of control in your, in your thinking. Have a balanced approach to life. While other people may hear of the end and they start getting nervous, we're, we're seeing everything in light of the end, knowing what God has already told us is coming. So we don't panic. We don't lose control. We live a controlled life. People say all is lost. We say no. All is gained. We don't lose control. Also, sober-minded, clear-headed, Seeing life and light of eternity, the sobriety that Peter tells his readers a few other times that they are to live in. Back in 113, he tells them, he uses the same word, therefore preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, being clear thinking, preparing your minds for action, tightening your belt, girding up the loins of your minds, it says the King James. Tightening your belt, we would say. Taking all those, those elements of our thoughts that are just floating everywhere and getting it all focused in one place. Tie it up. Pull it all together. And being sober-minded, being clear thinking. Then we can set our hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Sobriety in full control of your faculties and feelings. Be, so, be self-controlled and be sober-minded. If there's anyone who's thinking clearly, it should be Christians. Christians should be the clearest thinkers that you know on what's coming in the end. But notice here particularly, he says, for the purpose of your prayer. For the purpose of your prayers for the sake of your prayers. We should be self-controlled in our thoughts. We should be clear-minded. We should be pulling it all together for the sake of our prayers. That our prayers shouldn't be substituted by dwelling on these things we don't control. We shouldn't have our minds going from one thing to the next, the next news article taking us away that we're not even praying about the things 
that God would have us praying about. That means we have to be praying. We should be praying. But also our prayer should be directed in the right way. One commentator says, Peter's words also imply that prayer based on knowledge and mature evaluation of a situation is more effective prayer. That we're not just, we're not just praying anything, but we're praying in a particular way because we know already how this works out. So our minds don't go where everyone else's minds go. We aren't just praying for the physical. Lord, help this person with the bad leg. Help this person who was in a car accident, and we go from one thing to the next, and we never even pray about spiritual things. We've lost control. We're not thinking clearly. What's the most important thing for that person, that they get out of the hospital or that they're saved, that they get out of the hospital or that they heal or that they mature in faith? They may get out of the hospital and go to hell when they eventually die. But Christians say, no, 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 I know what's the most important thing here. And I pray to that end. It doesn't mean you can't pray for someone's physical health and all those types of things. But we're not overcome with those things. We're not overcome with our situation in life that we forget that this life is passing away. This world is passing away and all that is in it. And so we pray for those things that are eternal. So we don't let the things of this world then keep us from praying. As one pastor said, our phones, our mobile phones, will testify against us in the last day that we had more time to pray. We had more time to pray. When I was scanning through, I could have been praying. Our phones, our computers, our televisions, all these things, we had more time to pray. And as Christians, we recognize that. We recognize that the end is near. Whatever I'm looking at now is passing away. Let me pray and focus on eternal things. Another commentator says, the realization that God is bringing history to a close should provoke believers to depend on him. And his dependence is manifested in prayer. For in prayer, believers recognize that any good that occurs in the world is due to God's grace. If we are clear thinking, we realize that whatever the Lord is doing, it is his to do. And whatever he's doing in our lives, any good thing that I get in this life is his doing. And therefore, my prayers are directed towards him, for him, for his glory. We need to guard our prayers, guard the fact that we do pray, guard what we pray. But not only do we, are you to guard your prayers, but notice he also says in verse 8 to persevere in love. And he begins that by saying, above all, above all things. That doesn't mean above praying, do this. It means above all things in relation to uh, your relationship to other people. Above all things. Keep loving one another earnestly. Keep loving one another earnestly. Love for one another, having a fervent love for yourselves, literally. In verse 9, he talks about one another, but it's actually a little different there. Here it, it says, keep loving yourselves. Keep loving yourselves making the point that we are all one body. If you're in Christ, you're part of the body, and you are to love yourselves, not yourself, but love one another as we are part members of one body, 1 Corinthians 12, 12. We are members of one body. Jesus said the the second greatest command is to love your neighbor as yourself. We are to persevere in love. In 1 Thessalonians, Paul is, commends their love in chapter 1 and verse 3, their labor of love. But then he, he gets to the end of chapter 3 and he says, now may, God, now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way to you and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you. 
You say, I do love people. Okay, then abound in love. Grow in love. There's always more love there. I haven't reached the pinnacle of loving other people. And so I should constantly be looking at how I can demonstrate my love for others. In 1 Peter 1, he talks about a, an unhypocritical love. Since you have an obedience to the truth, purify your souls for sincere love of the brethren. Fervently love one another from the heart. And we know what Jesus says. They will recognize my disciples by their love one for another. And obviously this is different than what we should see in the world. We said this when we were looking at First Thessalonians 5 a year ago about peace. You go outside, there's chaos, there's, there's war. But we come inside the church and people should say, oh, why are you guys not fighting? Why aren't you guys at one another's throats? No, because we love one another. Do we sin against one another? We do, but we love one another. What's the world like? Well, Matthew 24, 12, because lawlessness has increased, most people's love will grow cold. That will happen in the end times. What's happening now? Romans 1, 31 says that people will be unloving and unmerciful. 2 Timothy 3, 3, Paul describes the latter days for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, unloving, irreconcilable. When people come in here, they should see the exact opposite. We should stand out because of our love for one another displayed in how we treat one another and how we act towards one another and how we pursue one another. Not because of what we get out of it, not because of this is a person I like. No, because that is my brother, that is my sister. I must love them. I must love them. But he doesn't just say love them. He says love them earnestly, fervently. As the word there is the, the idea of, a, of an athlete who's running the 100 meters, full stride, or, or a horse race. The horse is in full stride, right? The, 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 the earnestness for which we are to try to reach the goal of love, pursue one another in love to that extent that we reach out that far in full effort to show love to others. Why do we do this? Verse 8 says, since love covers a multitude of sins. Proverbs 10, 12, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all offenses. War outside, love inside. And what will love look like? A multitude of sins will be covered. A multitude of sins will be covered. No bitterness, no unforgiveness, no seeking of revenge, but love, but love. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind, on and on. It doesn't boast, it does not envy, it doesn't keep a record, it doesn't take a wrong into account. All these things, demonstrations of love. We are patient with one another. We, we give each other the benefit of the doubt. When someone does sin against us, we go and pursue them. We were telling the parenting class yesterday about um, a couple of days ago, we were at the station, and I was with the family, and we had gone through the, the gates, and right after I got through, we hear this big commotion. And we look over, and there's these about eight or so guys punching each other in the face. A big brawl had broken out. They had brought it into the station. And we're, <laughs> and I'm sitting there looking. Um, and the family, they, they went, they got on the tube. They were going somewhere. I was trying to get out, but I couldn't because they were blocking the gate. So I just sat and watched <laughs> and see how that was going to work out. And um, they're punching each other, and finally it, it calms down. You see one guy, he's got blood coming out the side of his face. Another guy got blood coming down his nose and his mouth. And I'm, I'm thinking, wow, well, that didn't work out for those guys. And then 
Um, they're sitting there and waiting for an ambulance for some of them and I guess the police to show up. While, I'm, while I'm, I can't go anywhere but watch, um, <laughs> I watched these guys and, and, and one side said, you, you shouldn't have. And those guys said, we didn't do that. We didn't say that. I'm thinking, and, and a few minutes go by, and next thing you know, they're just talking like they were back in the pub. Just, yeah, yeah. And as I'm walking out, I'm thinking, wouldn't that be crazy if all that was a misunderstanding? I mean, they just beat each other up, and the whole thing might have just been a misunderstanding of words. Now, hopefully, we don't normally punch each other in the face here. Um, that's not our habit. Um, I don't think I've seen it so far while I'm here, but that doesn't mean we don't use words. Sometimes they hurt even more, don't they? And how sad it would be for someone to do that, to say something, to respond a certain way, only to find out if I had loved them, I would have asked them, is this what you mean, meant? Is this, did I understand you correctly? Did you, did you say that? Is that what you meant to say? Because that's what love does. It also bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. And that's what the church is characterized by. Not by acting in the moment, but by letting love cover a multitude of sins. That's how the church distinguishes itself. And that's what we do. That's what we do. 1 Corinthians 13 says it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. I'm not trying to keep up with this person's done this to me too many times. Oh, you're keeping record? Was well, that love? John Street was talking about being in a counseling session with this man and his wife. <laughs> and the... Uh, the wife, or he's asking them, what's, what's wrong with your marriage? What's going on? And the wife is, um, uh, pulls out a sheet of paper. <laughs> she has date and time. Date and time. She goes down, starts reading off each one. And on June 13th, right, she goes through it, and he sits there, and he listens. And when she gets to the end, he says, okay, I know what's wrong. You don't love your husband. Because if you loved them, you wouldn't be keeping a record. You wouldn't be keeping a record. Love does not keep a record of wrongs. The church is characterized by that. Where there's genuine Christian love, patience endures. There's, there's a desire for sin not to be exposed if possible. Sometimes it's not possible. But I always want to keep it as much as possible Privately, that's why the that's why Matthew 18 works the way it does. It's not tell the church and then take a few people, and then maybe we can work it out in private. This is oftentimes the way we approach it. Instead of well, let's see if this can be worked out in private. And if not, then maybe I need to take a few people to encourage them do what's right. And then not wanting to, but if we have to, we have to tell the church. That's the way it works. We, we want it to stay private, which is what we want when, when we're the culprit, <laughs> right? When we're the one who did it. I don't want people exposing my business. I, would, I, I mean, it's so easy to say, well, why didn't you just ask me? Why weren't you just patient with me? And as soon as, they, <laughs> as, soon as it's the other way around, everybody has to know. Everybody has to know. Oh, I'm going to give sharp words of rebuke. Or I'm going to challenge that before other people. No, there's a way for this to work. Love does that. Love covers a multitude of sins. Because we are sinners. We are going to sin against each other. We, are, we, haven't, we haven't worked this all out. We understand that. But we are people who repent. We're people who confess our sins one to another. We're people who go to each other and say, will you, will you forgive me? Not making excuses. <laughs> well, well, you know, if you hadn't have been so, you know, moody that day, I wouldn't have. Or, you know, I had, 
I had a hard day at work, and if you had understood the kind of day I, I had. No, no, no. I did this. I acted in sin. Please forgive me. And the other person says, love covers a multitude of sins. You're forgiven. Because that's what I want someone to do to me when I sin against them. We persevere in that. We guard our prayers. We persevere in love. But we also welcome the saints. Verse 9. We show hospitality to one another without grumbling. We invite other believers in. We, we take care of them. We refresh them. We make sure they're nourished spiritually, physically. And in, in our setting, that's not as big of a deal in our minds because we think, well, everybody kind of has their own thing. You do your own thing. You like somebody, you hang out with them. If you don't, it's okay. Just don't even bother with them. You just, you know, that's fine. But if you were in the New Testament, particularly when Peter is writing this book and persecution is kicking up, then when you said, I'm a follower of Christ, and then you were baptized, making this public profession of faith, your family disowned you. And if you didn't have the church as your family, you had no family. And if you were going into a city... Depending on the city, it could be very dangerous for any person to just try to work it out themselves. But if you don't have family, if you don't have people to welcome you in, then you have nothing. You have no one. You have to figure it all out on your own. And so the idea of hospitality was precious to them. To welcome one another in, to take care of one another. Romans 12, 13, contributing to the needs of the saints Practicing hospitality. Second John, who not to give hospitality to. Third John, who to give hospitality to. They make it very clear of those who, um, not those who would teach unsound doctrine, but those who are of the faith. Hebrews 13, 2, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers for thereby some have entertained angels unaware does that mean I need to go out on the street and start you know put up a sign stay at my house if you don't know me come here no obviously not that's not the point he's making and he makes that very clear in in first Peter show hospitality to one another this is talking about the function of the church the function of the church. Now, oftentimes we, we limit hospitality to welcoming in each other. You know, I like certain people, so I'll, I'll have them over. It's good. Don't, don't stop doing that. Um, but we should, we should kind of expand our thinking there a little bit to say, well, what about the people I don't know? Whether in this congregation or not. If I can help another believer... If I can help nourish them, refresh them, encourage them, bring them into my home, and somehow minister to them, then I do that if I can. Now, the thing is, that may not be where I have, you say, look, I, I live in a house with other people. It's not even my home. I can't, <laughs> Mama, look who I brought. Uh, you better take them where you found them, right? doesn't always work that way. doesn't always work that way. So you can't always bring them into your home. But it may mean just helping them in other ways. Can I help them find a place to stay? Can I provide a meal for them in another way? What can I do to help them be refreshed in one way or the other? And that is, captures much of what's taking place here. We do this for one another, for one another. Jesus said back in Matthew chapter 10, Matthew chapter 10, at the end of the chapter, about receiving those who are his. Whoever receives you receives me, and whoever receives me receives him who sent me. 
The one who receives a prophet because he is a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And the one who receives a righteous person because he is a righteous person will receive a righteous person's reward. And whoever gives one of these little ones even a cup of cold water because he is a disciple, truly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Because when I show hospitality, when I welcome in another Christian, as Jesus will say in Matthew 25, what you did to my people, you did to me. And if I can turn away other Christians without even thinking, how can I help them? Then what am I doing to the Lord himself? Now, (laughs) I'm guessing many of you are saying, well, that's not that bad. I, would lo- I love meeting new people. And I love having people over. But, you know, it's just those few words at the end that catch us without grumbling, without complaint, without mummering. Man, they always show up late, and then they don't know when to leave. I mean, just... Just leave. You know I got to work tomorrow. Just just get out. Just go. They bring their kids, and their kids make a mess. Hey, you can confess your sins. I'll give you a moment. They know my house is a mess, and now I got to clean up because they want to come over. Now I got to put all this stuff in that same cupboard I put it in last time without grumbling, without complaint, without being irritated, annoyed, upset, without thinking about the cost of time, the cost of money, the cost of energy. I already went to the shop. Now I got to go. I got to go all the way back over there to feed all these people. Without grumbling, without grumbling, with joyful hearts that we get to serve God's people, that I get to bring them in and somehow refresh them. How many times have you been reluctant to have someone over or to spend time with someone, whether it's you going there or them coming to you, just because of the busyness of life and all the stuff that that would take? And then you do it and you're like, man, I should do that more often. <laughs> like, yeah, you should. You're right. Stop complaining. Obey the Lord. Be joyful that you have this new family in Christ. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. It has amazed me. The, the benefit that I've received is this of people back right before we came here. We drove from California to Virginia, from one side of the states to the other. And we stayed in a hotel one time, one time. People come. No, come stay with us. You, got, you have to come stay with us. I'm thinking, I'm not going your way. No, no, no. You're going my way. Come stay with us. Okay, I guess we're, I guess we're going there. But people... People were insistent that they would do what they could to show hospitality. We want you here. We want to serve you. Let us do it. And then I have to ask myself, is that how I treat it? Or do I treat it as, well, if they come, then I, do we have enough room? And do I, I gotta, No. Show hospitality without grumbling without grumbling. We guard our prayers. We persevere in love. We welcome the saints. And then he says at the end, be a good steward of God's gifts. Be a good steward of God's gifts. And notice what he says here. As each has received a gift, not some, but each. If you are a Christian, 
then you have received a spiritual gift. So you can't say, well, I'm, I don't have what other people have. Well, you may not, but you have something. You have something because each has received a gift. If I am in Christ, I have, I have something I can do to, to help the church in one way or the other, maybe more on an individual basis, more in a, maybe on a more on a larger scale, but I have something I can do for other people in the family of God. The Holy Spirit is in me if I am in Christ. And so the, the church does not have useless members. At one time, um, it was being promoted that there were certain parts of your body you don't need, like your tailbone. To which someone said, well, let me take yours out and see if that's true, right? They know everything has a purpose. Everything has a, has a purpose. Some more up front, some not. That's not even the issue. Who, who cares? We take what we get and we use it. So he says that everyone has a gift. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. So what's the purpose of my gift? For serving one another. It's not for me. It's for everyone else. This whole section, verse 8, keep loving one another. Verse 9, Show hospitality to one another. Verse 10, use your gifts to serve one another. It's all for the bettering of the body. Do it so that the body can be built up. Do it for the function of the whole. If you're selfish, then you will hold on to what the Lord has given you for yourself. So the obvious question is, okay, where are you using your gifts for other people? Who's benefiting from what the Lord has given you? How is the church better off because you are in the family? Not just you, like, oh, well, I'm me. I'm bubbly and I'm blah, blah, blah. No, no one cares about that. Great. Be whatever you are, except don't sin. But you have a gift, so use it. Use your gift and use it for other people so verse 10 everyone has a gift as each has received a gift use it to serve one another so it's not for you it's for others as good stewards of God's varied grace your gift is a stewardship a stewardship in other words it it didn't come from you it really doesn't belong to you this is about being a good manager of what you've been given to use something has been entrusted to you to make the most of for the benefit of others God gave it therefore it belongs to him you have that responsibility to him to use it you hear about the 20% 80% ratio in, in churches as far as people who are involved people who are functioning who sometimes sadly are tending um, who are giving, who are doing all these things, functioning as the church, 20% doing 80% of it. You guys ever heard that, the 20%, 80% rule? 20% do 80% of the, of the work. And that is not God's design. You use your gifts as good stewards of God's varied grace. In this world, Back in chapter 1, he talks about the various trials we will face. But God has given us ver various gifts to his people that minister to people as they're going through these trials. We help one another. We, we help one another in this life as we await the end. As we await the coming of Christ. And so he says in verse 11, whoever speaks, not Everyone will speak, but whoever, some will, some won't. Some are pastors and teachers and um, evangelists and all these things have a particular gifting in that area. Great. If you have it, what do I do with it? As one who speaks the oracles of 
God. The utterances of God. In Acts 7, 38, in Romans 3, 12, the same phrase, oracles of God, is, is used to refer to the Old Testament, to refer to the Scriptures. So if I am speaking, and I've been given the gift of speaking, whether in public or in private, in a counseling way that I can, then what do I speak? Well, the only thing God has given me, and that is his word. I don't make up my own stuff. I don't just give my opinions and mix it in with God's word. I, I say what he has given me. If it's a speaking gift, then I need to be speaking what God has told me to say and nothing else. That is the responsibility, taking seriously that stewardship. And we should take this to heart. That doesn't mean everybody rushes to this. We know the warning of James 3, 1. There's more condemnation, more judgment that awaits those who would exercise their tongues. You're speaking judgment upon yourselves when you're misusing your words. But that's not the only thing that you can do. Whoever serves is one who serves by the strength that God supplies. Some people speak, some people serve. I do one or I do the other. Maybe you have a little bit of both, but whatever it is, you're using it for the Lord. Not in my own strength, but in the strength that God supplies. That means I shouldn't oversell myself and think that it's because of me that I'm able to do anything for the Lord. No, I'm, I'm fully trusted in the Lord's strength. I'm submissive to him. He gets the glory from that. And I don't undersell it. Well, I can't do anything. No, God supplies the strength. So therefore, I need to be doing something. Why? In order that in everything, God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Some people say, you say, hey, what are you, what are you doing for the Lord? What are you doing to help the body of Christ? And you say, well, I'm not really too good at anything. Um, okay. Well, realize this. If you're doing nothing, then you're robbing God of the glory that he deserves. Think about it that way. Think about it that way. Look, I appreciate people who do set up, who serve coffee and tea and do these things. Um, let me just say, those are not spiritual gifts. An unbeliever can, <laughs> can, can pour that cup. The good things, please keep doing If you're doing that, do it. If you clean the church, hey, we appreciate all of that. But those are not spiritual gifts. You could do that before you came to Christ. Does that make sense? But there are things you do and you're able to do because you are a Christian. That you're particularly gifted in that people recognize he's very helpful in that. He's very helpful in that way. That's, that's of benefit to the church. That's, that, that builds me up when I am with him in that way. That is building up the body. Christ is glorified. Great. So if you're visiting from an, another church, it's good to have you come back again if you're in town. Go back to your church and give glory to Christ through serving that church. If you are here and you come here and just say, this is, you know, this is my church. Not I own the church, but this is, this is my home. Then do something that gives glory to Christ. Use your gifts. Let God be glorified. How does it give glory to Christ? Because Christ is the one who died for you to bring you into the family of God. And it's his spirit that operates in you to be able to do those things. So do something. Do something. And honor Christ. Let him receive the glory in you being busy for him and doing your part to function within the body, and to build up the family of God. If you are a good steward of God's gift, you will be using your gift for his glory, displayed 
and serving his body. And remember the Christ we're talking about. To him belong glory and dominion and forever and forever. And if you believe that, then that will motivate you. Okay, I don't, I don't know what I can do. <laughs> Maybe you are pretty, you know, you're almost useless. Or you feel that way. Do something. Do something. Be in the gathering of believers. Function in that gathering. And let those gifts that the Lord has given you, they, they will show themselves. They don't show themselves sitting down with a bag of crisps thinking about, I wonder what I could do. That does nothing for Christ. Nothing for Christ. Be in the body. Be in the gathering. And it will, it will show itself. Certainly we need people to do these, these practical things. Praise God for that. Get involved in that. Great. But consider, okay, when I am interacting with people, when I am hearing about the needs of people, when I am hearing what people are going through, what can I do to build them up? What can I do? The end of all things is at hand. What are you doing for Christ? What are you doing to bring glory to him? What are you doing in the church of God to glorify his son? Let's pray. Lord, may we seek to bring all glory to Christ. He is worthy of all glory. To him belongs all glory. He has a glory that never changes, and yet you have saved us to bring glory to him. So help us to do that in praying and showing love for one another and showing hospitality, Lord, and using what you have given us to honor you. Help us not to look at the end and sit down and get lazy. Help us to look at the end and get busy, realizing that there, there's only one of these. This is our life, fastly going away. Christ. In one way or another, we will see him soon. So may we prepare ourselves for that. And when we see him, welcome him. We welcome him with the things that we have done because he has shown us grace. Please do this in our lives where we have been lazy, where we have resisted these things, where we have not been prayerful where we have not shown love, where we have not welcomed in strangers, where we have not been busy building up the church with our gifts. Lord, forgive us. Show each one of us where we have failed, that we may repent and confess those things and do what pleases you. We thank you for your spirit that will allow us to do that, that empowers us to do that. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.